Welcome to Foreigners and Friendship, a series of podcasts. We present a number of bonus tracks connected to our radio show. You can listen to conversations with artists and activists, reports from festivals and other larger events, essays, reviews, poetry and letters. We see ourselves as part of a non-binary rebellion with the intention of creating a language and a human condition by on race, ethnicity, gender, sex and class. Tear down these walls, dismantle the statues of power and meet the other with an open spirit. Welcome to Louisiana Literature 2018 and an interview and conversation between Morten Ranum and Guadalupe Nettel. Morten Ranum met Guadalupe Nettel in a jacket version of herself directly flew in from Mexico City. She was attending Louisiana Literature on that year to present her recently translated book El Cuerpo en que nací, I kroppen hvor jeg blev født, published by the small publisher, Danish publisher Griff. The conversation starts by Morten Ranum explaining which journal he is writing for, and thereafter they have a conversation about Guadalupe and her authorship. It is um, an online magazine. It has existed for 15 years, oh, wow. and it has specialized always in news from, you could say, outside Europe. Mm. Originally, it was it was founded with the purpose of writing about development issues from Latin America, from African countries, and from Asian countries. But later on, the name was changed to Global News to kind of emphasize on that it's not only development issues but also general news feed on okay. from around the world. Because a lot of Danish media, or European media for that matter, are only interested in in things that affect Europe directly, affect us directly. Yeah. Otherwise, that is election or a catastrophe or war or something like that. But this agency tries to kind of follow the normal, so to speak, if you can talk, talk about that, news stream in different countries around the world. Mm-hmm. And I am affiliated to the art and culture section, so I write reviews or I write uh, reports from from festivals on all the kind of cultural events okay. in Denmark and also traveling in different, different various countries. Usually, I write about East Central African countries, but also a little bit about Central America, mm-hmm. where I have also been traveling, uh, uh, yeah, and Mexico. Oh, Where I have been, uh, yeah, a couple of times, yeah, oh, yeah, wow. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I can't speak Spanish also, but uh, <laughs> really? but uh, but let's do that. <laughs> we, that I was going. You, we can do it also, but my Spanish <laughs> is not so good. I don't know how your English is, but uh, you will see. It's yeah, but you clicking. can. But but if there's something, you can shift into Spanish if you feel like it, good. because uh, That's good to that will be. I can understand mostly, or at least uh, when I listen to it, I can understand it. <laughs> Thank you for for this. Time. I have read your book, which has just been published, mm-hmm. uh, with uh, with great I- interest. Actually, uh, I really enjoyed it, and it was uh, it was yeah. it was striking, because it actually uh, <laughs> it reminded me a lot about my own childhood in, in the seventies, <laughs> which was a little bit. I don't know if it was surprising, but it was interesting that that this this girl who is um, who is, who feel very alienated all the time eh? mm-hmm. and who almost tries to to walk around the wall or something like that. It reminds a lot about being, you know, being different also in a in a Danish European context, mm-hmm. uh, which was was interesting for me. <laughs> so actually, so so I was. That's I, interesting for I, me I, too. <laughs> yeah, I was wanting to ask you that because when I read this book, I was, I was thinking, could it really take place everywhere in the seventies? Because there's all this reference to. Um, the music names and all the cultural events and uh, of international uh, importance and and specifics about the seventies, leftist seventies environment and uh, mm. how you have to treat your 
kids in a political correct way or something like that. <laughs> uh, but it's still written from a Mexican perspective somehow because there's still some reference to, to Mexican things like I can the feel World in the background. Cup and the yeah. earthquake. But, but otherwise it is a very general history about this girl who grew up uh, under different circumstances and she's placed in different environments and uh, she tries to find herself somehow. Mm -hmm. So I mean, is it, is it a general story or how is it rooted in your mind also in kind of where you come from and where you Well, it's it's autobiographical, absolutely. Everything is autobiographical. So I just put my story down. Yeah. And it was the first time I was doing that, you know, because I published some novels before that weren't at all autobiographical. Yeah, which was fiction yeah. in a more kind of traditional sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then I had a request from a Mexican magazine to write an autobiographical text and I said why not let's try it. Mm -hmm. I started and I couldn't stop it had um, the coincidence that my first son was born at the time I was writing the story so I st started comparing the circumstances in which he was born and the circumstances where I was born mm -hmm. and okay. I started thinking about all this which is very different Very, very so you you actually didn't choose this autobiographical genre. It was kind of at pushed upon you or something. Yeah, like that. at the beginning, yes, because they asked me for a long, like a, let's say, eighteen between fifteen and eighteen pages, and then I couldn't stop. It just came, came, came. So what what was what was it that didn't make you stop? Or what was kind of intriguing about it? Or? I feel that I, exactly what you say. I, I I was writing the story of my generation and yeah. wanted to do that because at the, that time, it hasn't been told yet. But later on, a lot of Latin American writers at the same time, which is so strange, <laughs> yeah. were writing the same story. You know about okay, the seventies. Yeah. So now okay. there is a whole group of novels that tells the story of Latin Americans. Yeah around the world because they were exiled. So it's strange because I never felt that I was going to belong to movement or yeah, yeah, to a yeah, yeah. wave or anything, yeah, you know? Yeah. I was feeling, as I said, there, outsider. I always yeah. felt outsider. Yeah. But then suddenly you also, in your real life, became part of... <laughs> yeah. Also, that is also what she's, what's, what happens here, actually, that she more and more becomes part of something. Something. She yeah. feels part of, of the outsider's clan. Yeah, it's only a matter of, of, of meeting these people that that is also kind of at yeah. the borderline of something. Yeah. Then I found out where are all the topics of my writing come from, you know? Because I always felt attracted to the what I call the monsters, the beauty of the monsters. Yeah. I always have written about that, but from the fiction perspective. So the topics are more or less the same yeah, in, in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. So, so you put your you actually put your topics into this autobiographical kind of. Yeah, concept. and that's oh, that's the perspective I choose to give it to it, because life and a real story has so many many faces that you yeah. can choose course, yeah, or deny. Yeah, yeah. So what yeah. I tried to put it's. What I tried to do is put the light into the this outsider thing, into mm. this context, the historical context, yeah. and also feeling of not belonging to anywhere and, yeah. and try to yeah. to accept who we are, mm. to yeah. Yeah. come back home. Yeah, as, okay. Yeah. As Ginsberg yeah. said, return <laughs> to the body where we. Yeah, are exactly. Home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. But you are talking also about the exile situation that that. A generation where people are actually moving back and forth, and and here the girl is also taken to France and taken yeah. back and taken in different. I mean, is mm -hmm. because I was thinking when I was reading it that there's also maybe we are also since the seventies and the kind of decades after we are in a situation of exile. There's a lot of people who are in exile, or we could call it, who live in diaspora in in a part of their lives, or. Or, which is also connected to to the whole immigration um, mm -hmm. uh, problematic, mm -hmm. and and maybe there's a lot of um, authors around the world who are who are in that kind of identity. Yeah. That so our novels maybe are also 
They're more between, similar yeah. than they could be before, maybe. Or, or I don't know if that is true. It was just a line of thought that I had at some point. I think you're right. Right, reading it. Because now in this global world, on this yeah. globalization, global village of the COVID, <laughs> <laughs> it's people move much more than before. So if you take a look on the 19th century literature, you won't find people like living in different countries. You will mm. find like people doing trips or journeys yeah. to Italy yeah. or to, but not moving and immigrant. Immi yeah. Yeah, yeah. Immigrant. Because I, because maybe I'm, I'm also myself confronted with it because this, this journal and agency is kind of have somehow um, this idea that that we have to cover something from around the world and and the understatement is because it is different somehow and and, and somehow I encounter time after time uh, when I for example meet authors like you from from Mexico or from other kind of Latin American countries that there's not so much that difference of course at all we have the same kind of reference in terms of literature, in terms of cultural things, and, and also the writing is not as exactly the same, but, but, but there is some similarity or some familiarity yeah. uh, that makes us uh, understand each other in, mm -hmm. in a way that we maybe should not do because we are born in different places. But It's not only the culture and, um, and the generation, but it's also a matter of feelings and empathy I think that the power of literature is yeah. actually that one you know mm. that it allows you to feel the way or to connect with the subjectivity of the author you have who has written the story when you yeah. read it because writing is the more intimate thing either it's autobiographical or not because even if you take a um, fictional yeah. situation you're putting your feelings on it Mm. And all human beings have a certain range of of feelings, not so many. Yeah, yeah. It's like the notes, you know, like the. So you mean we come we, through literature? We come. We can to know each other better. Or it's, yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. There yeah. is a beautiful te text of Amos Oz, you know, the Israeli writer. Yeah. Who, when he won the the Principe de Asturias Prize. He wrote about that, he wrote about, he said that when we go to a to foreign country, if we are lucky, we can have, uh, we, we can see a woman by the window and see how she is. If we are very lucky, we are invited to her place and have dinner with the family. Yeah. But when they read a novel from another country, yeah. We are invited to the bedroom, to the children's room, yeah. to the more intimate and separate yeah. places mm. of this yeah. lady here, yeah. this house. Yeah. So that's how we can. So you are thinking. So so what you are saying is that literature has a certain kind of capacity in terms of, uh, kind of opening opening up this uh, private space or something yeah. like that. And so developing empathy. But but you mean is is that also in comparison with other art forms? Does literature have some kind of another kind of? Uh, I think so. Quality in that way yeah. that music or visual art doesn't have. Or... Visual arts and music, especially music, are really connected with the feelings. You yeah. feel something, yeah. and it's an abstract feeling. Okay. You can say it's sad or mm. it's joyful yeah. or it takes you yeah. to somewhere in terms of feelings. But words are much more subtle. Mm. They really bring you a situations, emotions and, and conceptions and inner you know, concepts and things like that in a huge like in very different ways. In a larger, larger yeah. And is that because here um, in Denmark and also other parts of Europe there has been kind of this revival of of autobiographical texts, or there is also a lot of books written kind of on the borderline between facts and fiction, mm -hmm. and the, the, who has become some kind of a genre of that mm -hmm. over the last couple of decades. So fiction, because... Yeah. And somehow there is the, the idea that, that there we would come closer to something. I mean, you're talking about being invited into the bedroom, or but the question is, is, is the autobiographical kind of a, a further invitation, or it's is it just another type of fiction? 
Because before you were saying that that it's not only the biographical text who has yeah. this capacity, it is fiction I, at I all. It's fiction yeah. or literature in general, so to speak. Yeah, because when you write fiction, you're putting also the, the, your your feelings, your experience, etc. Otherwise, you, it couldn't be alive, you know? It, it wouldn't be a, a, a text pulsation. Yeah. Like, so, I, so should we just regard autobiographical text as another type of fiction? Mm-hmm. Because it, I mean, somehow I could read this um, as fiction, With, without yeah. knowing it, and it I mean, doesn't matter actually. Because I was thinking about it. One, do I do I have to do I have to know it is it is your story? Mm-hmm. Do I have to know um, that it is something that happened to mm-hmm. a girl, or or can I just read it as from my as another view, novel? Yeah, from my point of view, you can read it as another as another novel. It doesn't matter. So it would not. It would not. Uh, in your mind, it would not be. It would not come out any different. No, and no. it's funny because when you write fiction, the write the reader is always trying to find out what is autobiographical. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And when you write autobiography, the reader always wants to know what is invented. When did he lie? Yeah, <laughs> there's this. Uh, but that is an obsession of the audience. I think the yeah. reader. Which which maybe always be be there, eh? uh, and which can be a little bit annoying for the for the writer, I think, eh? often. Uh, but the other thing is is what is how can we how can we kind of evaluate or mm-hmm. uh, how can we describe the different kind of texts? And maybe it is just fiction, and When and I that is the end of it. This character of the psychoanalyst, yeah. which is not actually yeah. a character, but just just an in- yeah. interlocutor. Yeah. <laughs> You, I, I was thinking about the reader actually, so it's like the reader is going to be my psychoanalyst in a way, you know. Lacan used to say that even a monkey could function as a, as a psychoanalyst if he's sitting there, yeah. because what really matters is what the patient is talking about and understanding about mm. his story. So you think that. That every because because it is that is the one thing where I kind of uh, <laughs> was pushed out of the stream of the of the book. Actually, this is every time that that the shrink is there or that the <laughs> psychoanalyst is there, but because he he or she is not there, uh, but only there is this sentence every kind of once in a while. There is a sentence Doctor where where the girl or the woman is is saying something to the psychoanalyst. <laughs> yeah. He's not, or she is not responding, mm-hmm. and the story just continues. Yeah, and and that was I don't know, uh, but but that but you were saying that is the actually the a, a question to me as a reader, that I have to answer. Yeah, if I want, <laughs> if you or want. what? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that was the the joke, you know, my personal joke. Yeah. So that is the reason why it is there, mm-hmm. uh, to kind of play on. To kind of. Put questions very directly to the reader and not mm-hmm. to uh, yeah yeah because sometimes you're waiting for at some point maybe that I I I, I remember feeling that at some point there must be more than mm-hmm. than that but it was <laughs> never <laughs> there was never anything yeah. only that you in the end of the book then you kind of try to make some kind of a conclusion or you let the woman uh, kind of mm-hmm. conclude something about and also display that she's also a writer who who became a writer eh? yeah. through this uh, story somehow and through because literature was always there actually you know since the beginning yeah it was of course it was an interest of her all the time eh? and it was kind of popped up yeah what and, I mean. and it it's when i started writing stories about the children of my classroom. I thought that I, it was a rebel thing. <laughs> yeah. And then it was that fact that introduced me to the school society yeah. and finally I could find a place. It mm. was still an outside place, but I was more into the group because I had a function. I was the okay. one who was telling the stories. And in that way you, you became part of mm-hmm. the game, so to speak, or you, be, you became part of the public space Yeah, part the of the society. Yeah, of yeah, became you got enrolled somehow, eh? mm-hmm. yeah, uh, and not somebody, some some somebody who was invisible. And this is maybe also a 
uh, a very kind of uh, typical uh, kind of artist role. Eh? So you, I think I have heard many kind of artists and writers tell that type of story that, that you, you grew, grew up and was not really part of something and, and that's, that left you with some, yeah, some trauma maybe who, who was either converted in a, to a bigger trauma or into art. Yeah. Uh, as kind of a mm -hmm. not a therapy but but a way of uh, dealing with it maybe. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. To su sublimate as a psychoanalyst <laughs> would say. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, instead of going to the psychoanalyst you would uh, do something <laughs> else with it. And also I think that this psychoanalyst thing was very much into this generation too. I'm okay. maybe I'm wrong, maybe yeah. there are still many psychoanalysts, but I think that it was very much to that generation, to the 70s and yeah. 80s. Yeah, probably also that you were kind of trying to find yourself or something, mm -hmm. uh, or, or discuss for yourself in a certain way. Yeah. Now there yeah. are many other therapies, different kinds of therapies. Oh, yeah, you mean that specific therapy where you sit yeah. in a room or is on a couch or... Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's actually, so you think, you think about it as a kind of a generation novel who is written yeah. To a to a Mexican audience who has the same kind of uh, not only uh, to reference Mexican or to audience, a, no. I think that to any person who had similar, you know, like I've read novels written like this from other countries, like for instance France, and I also felt I yeah. identified with it. Uh, also, stories about Argentinians living in Germany. Yeah. And, this kind of exile situation, but I mean it. It is not um, even you know like yeah. um, Marjan Satrapi's Persepolis. In a way, it feels familiar, you know, because they yeah. had to run away, the country changed so much, and yeah. the the family was progressive, yeah. and the and the the other the society wasn't so much. Okay, so in that way, it, it becomes yeah on a more general. Uh, that was my uh, question. It was very really interesting. Yeah, it was very really enlightening, actually. Is there something you want to add? say or add <laughs> or ask? <laughs> no. No? Okay. So I'm, I'm so tired. Yeah, know? yeah, I know. So. That is also why I thought it should not be too long, actually. Mm. Uh, but um, good luck at the festival. Thank you so and, much. And uh, thank you for your time. Mm. Yeah. Thank I will you. come and listen to you later. Great. You have this uh, event later, yeah. Yes. yeah. And then you have this uh, talk with the Mariana tomorrow Sunday. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, tomorrow is it? I think I'm on. It is on Sunday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay. what's going on on Sunday? The festival goes on till. No, the it ends on Sunday. Yeah, Sunday. Um, Sunday evening. It started yesterday, and then it ends uh, Sunday late afternoon or something. So since when is it happening? Like. Uh, it has been here for many years now, and it's kind of a, it's established as a important literature festival. And I also know. because they the museum had had now a capacity to actually uh, invite mm -hmm. uh, people from also abroad, also from outside Europe. So so it is one of the places you can actually go to to also mm -hmm. meet foreign writers. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been some other attempts uh, inside Copenhagen to also make literary festivals, but they have not been so steady. And so, in that way, it is an important place. When and did then it the start? museum is also like more than ten years. Or? Uh, maybe something like ten years. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank See you. See you later. You have listened to a bonus track by Foreignness and Friendship. If you have built up an appetite for more, then you can follow us on the white African blogspot.com and walk in our footsteps by stepping into in my footstep wordpress.com. We broadcast new episodes of our radio show every first Tuesday of the month available on your preferred platforms.